Well, good morning. Welcome to Pine Island United Methodist Church, where we exist to reach people with God's love, transform lives, and change the world. We are so glad that you're here worshiping with us this morning, whether you are here in person or whether you're worshiping with us online. I have a few announcements for us. Uh, First of all, we'd love for you to sign the black attendance pads that are at the end of your pew. Just go ahead and fill out your information and pass that on to the person beside you. I'd like to give, we had our rummage sale yesterday. It was a beautiful day. We had so much traffic through, and I'm happy to report that it was very successful. We made over $1,500 yesterday. So So hopefully that gives us enough money to get that, um, the deck replaced on the front of our building and maybe do a little bit of extra work as well. Um, I just want to let you all know, you may have noticed uh, signs on the restrooms. We are having some septic issues. We know about it, but the, it causes the toilets to not flush very well. The trustees will be taking care of that this week. We just found out yesterday for sure what the problem was, so um, it will get taken care of this week. Um, but I just wanted to let you know. Next Sunday, we will be having a special guest with us. I'm going to back up. I talked about the rummage sale. And before I move on, I want to give a special shout out to two ladies over here and their husbands. These two couples spent a lot of time here doing a lot of work. Um, Larry and Jolene Davis and Mary and Roger, Mary Bousquet and Roger Hobson. So I would really like us to thank them. All right. So next Sunday... We will have a special guest with us. Her name is uh, Reverend Sandra Santiago. She will be here from the Florida United Methodist Foundation, and she'll be preaching for us um, next Sunday morning. So I do hope that you'll all come and hear her. Um, She's going to give us a a beautiful message on stewardship and teach us about that. Um, And then she'll also be giving a workshop to our youth after the service to do a lesson with them on that, too. Wanted to let you know, we are having our work day, April the 2nd, and there is a sign-up at the welcome desk, so you can sign up there and put your email and phone number just in case we need to get in touch with you before that day. It will be focused on outdoor cleanup, so we'll be doing some washing, some windows, some power washing, um, just filling in some of the potholes in the parking lot, and just some maintenance on the outside of the building. It will be from 10 a.m. to 12 noon. So just a couple of hours in the morning before it gets too terribly hot outside. And also, be sure to enjoy coffee and donuts this morning. We've got coffee out there that Lois made for us, and then we have some donuts that were donated. So please enjoy those this morning. Now will you pray with me? Open our eyes, our ears, our hearts and spirits this morning, Lord that we may be healed of our faithlessness, freed from our fears and anxieties, and placed on the pathways that lead to peace and service to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now stand with me if you would, please, and let's sing Grace Greater Than All Our Sins.
keep singing. <laughs> now remain standing. We're going to sing the heart of worship. simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required Search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you All about you, Jesus I'm sorry my big kids today all right so I have a question for you um, what do you think would happen if you just ate candy and cookies and ice cream and the only thing you ever drank was soda and you even used soda to like brush your teeth you get sick, <laughs> you get sick right no <laughs> most said you would have no teeth that's probably true. Um, so why is that, do you think? Why do you think that would happen? Because you've got to eat healthy food. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Mo said, because you've got to eat your spinach, like Popeye, right? So what are, what are some healthy foods that we should eat? What are some things that we need to eat? Spinach. spinach. <laughs> 
vegetables, fruits, those kinds of things, right? And do other people in your life help you to make those healthy choices, even though maybe we don't always want to do that? Yeah. I know, I know that Mr. Paul does that for me a lot. So I ask about healthy and unhealthy foods um, because it's kind of similar to the things that are going to be talked about in today's scripture. And in today's scripture, Jesus is telling his disciples a story about a gardener. And it kind of goes like this. So this owner uh, of some land wants a gardener to cut down this fig tree because it won't grow any fruit on it. And so the gardener says to the owner, Hey, chill out. Like, let's wait a minute. I'm going to give it some good food and, like, let's give it a year and see how it does. So when the owner hears that, uh, he gives him a year to, for the plant, the, for the tree to grow fruit. So, all right, we're going to think outside the box a little bit. So if we pretend that the gardener in the story is like God, then we see that God is wanting to help, to help the tree grow and to grow fruit and give us food. And if we pretend that we're like the tree in the story, then we can think about some of the healthy foods that God might offer us, right? Food like foods. So, for example, when God gives us love and wisdom and patience, those are the healthy things that he's giving us to help us grow stronger. And then when we have all of those more of God's love, wisdom, and patience, we get to give those things to others. We're growing that fruit to share to, with other people. Just, so just like in the day's uh, scripture, the, the tree was given healthier food so that it could grow its own food and that it could go and give all the, uh, the, food, the fruit to everybody else. So the more of God's love and wisdom and patience that we receive, the more of God's love, wisdom, and patience that we can go and share with other people. Make sense? All right. Ready to break? Yeah. Dear God, help us to receive your gifts of love, wisdom, and patience so that we can share your gifts with others. Amen. that Janet Shepard and Dorothea Doty would come up here with me. It's a sad day in our congregation, these two ladies who have been um, vital parts and members of our congregation. This is their last Sunday with us. Um, they're both moving up north. So we want to take an opportunity to honor them and recognize um, what they have done for the life of our congregation. I'll come down this way so you guys don't have to come up. The church is a family, united by the common recognition of Jesus Christ as our Savior, and we are all brothers and sisters. And for a time, Pine Island United Methodist Church is our home. Like every human family, our church family is formed and reformed over time. As members are born, as they die, as members are adopted into our family, and as they leave our congregation for a new home in a different place. For a time, Dorothea and Janet have lived with us. We have shared with each other good times and bad. We have shared with each other's joys and sorrows. We have lightened each other's heavy loads. Together, we have laughed and cried. Together, we have worshiped and praised God. Together, we have lived. Congregation, will you join with me with the words on the screen? We feel sorrow in your leaving, yet we rejoice with you in anticipation of this new phase of your life. We will miss your love and support, yet we know you will add much to the lives of those who will be with you in your new church family, as you have added much to our lives. We will pray for you and for the whole family of God. Let us pray. God, you are the strength and the protector of your people. We humbly place in your hands Janet and Dorothea of this congregation who are about to leave us. Keep and preserve them, O Lord, 
in all health and safety, both of body and soul. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ. And now this morning, we're actually going to pass the offering plates, which is exciting. And I know some of you already put your offering in the back, and that's okay. You'll know next week you can hold on to it if you want to. However, so the the ushers will come forward. They will pass the plates. If you still feel more comfortable placing yours in the offering plate at the back, we will have one back there for you. You can also still mail in your check to the church office or you can set up um, a direct transfer with your bank. Will you pray with me? Patient and merciful God, we bring our offerings humbly on this day, hoping they will bring fruit to the ministry of your church on earth. We ourselves have not always set our priorities on bearing good fruit, and yet you are a patient gardener. You have sent saints into our midst to take the soil, to make the soil richer. Yet like the stubborn fig tree, good fruit has been scarce. May our journey this Lenten season feed our spirits to bring forth the fruit you desire. We pray in the name of our Savior and Redeemer, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Ushers, you may come. God, thank you so much for bringing us here together. Thank you for those who have come, those who are watching online who are unable to be here with us. We ask that you would bless all that goes on today. Bless the music, bless the preaching, bless the reading of your word. Bless our prayers and bless the hearts of everyone who are here. Please help us through this week that we might put you first. And now, We want to pray the prayer that God taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now sing, I love you, Lord, with me.
Good morning, everyone. Today's scripture lesson comes from the book of Luke, chapter 13, 1 through 9, <clears throat> be taken from the New Revised Standard Version. Repent or perish. At that, at that very time, there were some present who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were worse offenders than all the others in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. The parable of the barren fig tree. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, see here, for three years I have come looking for the fruit of this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, very well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. May God add a reading, a blessing to the reading of this word. Thank you, Richard, for reading our scripture today. And thank you, Bev, for our prayer this morning. This season of Lent is hard. These scriptures are challenging. Challenging to understand, but then challenging to put into practice. But it is in putting them into practice that we grow closer to God. And that is, after all, the goal of what we call sanctification. Growing closer and closer to God. Aligning ourselves more and more closely with the will of God on this journey called life. Lent gives us the opportunity to really hone in on this as we journey with Jesus toward Jerusalem, as we prepare ourselves for Easter. And we've been with Jesus in the wilderness when he was tempted, and we saw how he stayed fully engaged. And we are challenged to do the same in our own lives, and we do so with the help of others. And now we are traveling with Jesus on the road of his public ministry. Last week, we were there when some Pharisees warned him about Herod's desire to kill him. And we listened as Jesus lamented over the city of Jerusalem, comparing himself to a mama hen who desires to gather her chicks under her wings of protection. We remember that we are chicks and Jesus is our mama hen. Will we allow ourselves to be gathered under Jesus' wings? Will we gather others under our wings, loving them with the love of Jesus? Now this week, we hear Jesus yet again say some things that are difficult to understand. Our scripture today starts out like last week, with people coming to tell Jesus about something. Now, last week, it was about the threat on his own life. Today, it is about the lives of others. Some are present with Jesus who tell him about a tragedy that has taken place, as if they're reporting on current events. Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea, has committed an egregious act. He has had Galileans murdered while they were offering sacrifices, and then he mixed their blood with the blood of their sacrifices. The fact that the Galileans are making sacrifices means that they are in the temple in Jerusalem. Now, this heinous crime is offensive in so many ways to the Jewish people. There is the plain fact that it is murder, but that it took place in the temple, and that blood was mixed makes it all the more so. And then Jesus brings up this other tragedy, this one more of an act of nature. A tower in Jerusalem fell on 18 people and killed them. 
Now, Jesus' response to both of these tragedies is perhaps different than the people, or we even, expect. He doesn't offer platitudes. He doesn't explain why it happened. In fact, he actually removes the focus from the tragedies themselves and puts the focus on those listening to him. The question he asks after the telling of each tragedy is, do you think that because these people suffered in this way, that they were worse sinners or worse offenders than other Galileans or all the others living in Jerusalem? You see, in Jewish thought, assumptions were made about divine retribution. A correlation was made between punishments, especially catastrophes, and the crimes or sins people committed. So because of this, these people approaching Jesus, they might not have asked, what did these people do to deserve this kind of death? But that question was definitely lingering in the air as they told Jesus about this event. The thinking was that bad things happened to you because you had done something to deserve it. And conversely, right living brought about a life of blessing. We see this throughout the Bible. In particular, the story of Job in the Old Testament and then the story of the man born blind in the Gospel of John. In Job's story, we're told right at the beginning Job is a righteous man. But when his life turns upside down and terrible, awful things happen to him, his children die in a horrific accident. He contracts an awful skin disease, among many other things. His friends, instead of comforting him, insist that he has sinned in some way to bring all of this upon himself. And Job insists back that they are wrong. In the end, Job has this incredible experience with God. And what he learns is that he doesn't always understand the ways of God. But that doesn't make God any less. But what he also learned was that his friend's way of thinking was not correct. In fact, their way of thinking that what he had, that he'd done something wrong to bring these tragedies on to himself, that made God angry. Because they were more caught up with right thinking than they were with simply being with Job in his suffering. And in the story of the man born blind, Jesus is asked, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born this way? And Jesus' response neither. He goes on to say that the man was born this way so that God's works might be revealed. Again, we don't understand the ways of God because God is God and we are not. Now here in this story today, to this way of thinking, Jesus also emphatically says, no, this is not the way it works. Those Galileans, what happened to them had nothing to do with sins they had committed or wrongdoing that they had done. Pilate's decision to act in such a cruel way is in no way synonymous with God's justice, with God's way of being or acting in the world. And that tower that fell on the 18 living in Jerusalem Again, this had nothing to do with sin or wrongdoing on their part. Bad events occur that are not a result of human iniquity or divine penalty. In both of these cases, the people were victims of a surprising, unforeseen disaster. And often that is really difficult to swallow because we want answers When awful things are happening to us, to our loved ones, even in our world, we look for the why. Why is this happening to me, to them? What did I do to deserve this? Where did we go wrong? Or when those things are happening to someone else, perhaps our first thought is to wonder, 
What did they do to deserve that? We want someone or something to blame. But hear Jesus' words. No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will perish just as they did. No, that way of thinking, trying to cast blame on some, somewhere, that isn't the right way of thinking. He tells them to repent. Now, when we hear that word repent, we often immediately think of confessing our sins, asking for forgiveness, saying, I'm sorry. But repent in Greek is the word metanoia. And that word means to change, to turn, to change one's mind or think differently. Repentance is a significant theme throughout Luke's gospel. For Luke, it means to turn away from the assumptions, the attitudes, and the actions of the old age, that old way of thinking, and to live towards the values and practices of the kingdom of God as taught by Jesus, which can be summed up pretty well with love God and love your neighbor. So here, when Jesus tells uh, these people that unless they repent, they will perish, just as those who died in these tragic accidents, it isn't so much about confessing sins and asking for forgiveness as it is about turning from their old way of thinking, that way of looking for someone or something to blame for the tragic accidents and turning toward a new way of thinking, fruitful living. Repentance won't prevent people from dying or even from catastrophic deaths, but it will prepare us. Turning our thinking to the way of Jesus, loving God, loving our neighbors, fruitful living, prepares us for whatever may come. The deaths the people in our scripture today faced, they were sudden, unexpected physical deaths. Jesus' call to repentance here is not to save us from physical death. It's to save us from spiritual death. Turn from your old way of thinking toward this new way so that your soul will not perish unexpectedly. Life's fragility gives this message urgency. This urgency gives an opportunity for us to seize God's graciousness. What is God's graciousness? Well, that's found in the parable that Jesus tells about the fig tree. We have a fig tree planted in a vineyard, which raises questions already. (laughs) Why would a vineyard owner plant a fig tree in his garden? Well, inquiring minds want to know. So I went to Google. I found out that the same birds that are drawn to the seeds in grapes are also drawn to the fruit of the fig trees. So sometimes vineyard owners planted fig trees to attract the birds to those instead of the grapes. The fig tree acted as protection for the grape crop. Now that tidbit of information shed some light for me on the reasoning behind the vineyard owner being so angry at the fig tree. He's angry because the tree has not produced fruit. It isn't, it's been there for three years and it has not produced the fruit. And if it's not doing that, it isn't attracting the birds away from the grapes. So probably the grapes are getting eaten before he can harvest them. Well, that would be enough to make a vineyard owner angry. So, cut it down. He's like the queen in Alice in Wonderland, right? Off with her head. But here in the parable, we have a kind gardener who wants to give the tree a second chance, who promises to fertilize and tend the tree to see if he can't help it along. Help it bear fruit. He asks for one more year. And we aren't told the end of the story, 
But we assume the vineyard owner agreed. The tree gets one more year to see if it will bear fruit with the additional tending of the gardener. I can just imagine the gardener talking to the little tree, telling it, there is yet time, little tree. I'm not giving up on you yet. And that is what I hear God saying to us as well. God has not given up on us yet. There is still time. Time to repent, change our way of thinking, and turn toward Jesus' way. That is what Jesus is saying to the people listening to him. But just as the tree has a time limit, one more year, there is an urgency in Jesus' instructions to repent. Don't wait to turn and be fruitful because living according to Jesus' way, the way of the kingdom of God, that is fruitful living. Now, the gardener is going to dig around the tree and put manure in it to fertilize it. Now, we have fertilizer as well. Thankfully, ours smells better. Ours is what John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, referred to as the means of grace. These include reading scripture, praying, worshiping, fasting, participating in the Lord's Supper, something that he called holy conferencing, which was meeting together in a small group with other believers and having honest conversations. One of his favorite questions was, how is it with your soul? Participating in acts of mercy, which includes caring for the poor and those in prison, feeding and clothing people, making sure orphans and widows are cared for. In other words, loving your neighbor. By practicing the means of grace, we allow God to nourish us to fertilize us toward fruitful living. Fruitful living is full of love of God and love of neighbor. Now, I hear in Jesus' words a warning for us, though. A warning against false reassurances. Just because we have not been cut down does not mean we should presume we are bearing fruit. I could think of seasons in my life when this was true. I was, a busy, I was busy working, opening the opening shift at Starbucks, which meant that I had to be at work, usually by 5 a.m. As soon as I got off work, I went home, and I homeschooled Mo, and then I, we went to whatever activities that we had going on for the day. By 8.30, as you can imagine, I could barely keep my eyes open. I was burning the candle at both ends, as they say. I had all but given up my spiritual practice of reading scripture. I certainly prayed often, but not with the same intentionality that I once had. And quite honestly, I wasn't a very nice person during this time. I was still standing, but I was not bearing fruit. Thankfully, I experienced God's divine patience, like that gardener. And I recognized what had happened. I repented. I changed my ways. I turned my thinking around. Instead of blaming my circumstances for not having time, I recognized my part in me not having time. I made the time by clearing my schedule, saying no to a couple of things, and taking advantage of my morning break, reading scripture during that time. And I began once again to be fruitful, to love God, and my neighbor. That is the gift of Lent. It is this intentional time for us to take a look at ourselves. Are we bearing fruit? Are we fully in love with God and with our neighbor? If not, what do we need to repent of? What do we need to change? How do we need to turn our thinking in order to be more fruitful? Do you need more fertilizer in your life? If so, I encourage you. Dig around the tree. Do the work of the gardener. Practice those means of grace. Reading scripture. Praying. Worshiping. Meet with a friend or two for accountability. Practice acts of mercy. Caring for those in need. After all, 
We are all called to bear fruit. And when each one of us flourishes individually, our whole community flourishes as well. Will you pray with me? Jesus, we hear you calling us to repent, to change our way of thinking and turn toward your way of living, loving God and loving our neighbor. Repentance is hard work, and sometimes we aren't sure we are up to the task. But we know we want to bear fruit. We want to love God and love our neighbors. So will you speak to each of us now? Will you give us the courage we need to repent and turn toward you? Amen. Would you please stand with me and sing in the garden. The altar is open. There's coffee and donuts. But go now, living in the way that Jesus taught us. Loving God, loving neighbor, and bearing much fruit. Amen. Amen.